and you're all in his bag. Okay. <laughs> 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 but I know the Supreme Court I will testify, in the court of people will testify. But let us forget all these bad things <laughs> and remember <laughs> and the we are extremely fortunate. He is the best possible numerical simulation person in MHD. Many of you have heard GRMHD, 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 many codes can be downloaded, etc. All those codes are actually threats. Let me put it on the line. Because it's very difficult to make a uh, G, I mean, not available code which is dissipation free. You take a magnetic field and within half a, with, a, with just a few diameter time scale or even half diameter time scale, the magnetic field will work. Totally ignoring uh, Maxwell's uh, divergence of the equal to zero. Okay. So all the Maxwell's laws mean nothing to most of the courts. So one of the uh, interesting parts in the subject is to have the best possible code and the highest possible order accuracy. Probably third, fourth, fifth order accuracy. And for that, certain grids do much better than the other, and the orthogonal conditions, etc. I know very little about the subject. Linsho uh, uh, will be talking about it much more. I myself was interested to in astrophysics and in the hydrodynamic simulation because uh, after doing the theory, I know that the simulations have to prove that the solution is, is a stable solution. See, you can always give a solution. But then it may not be a stable solution, it could be an unstable solution. If you can have an equilibrium, it could be an unstable equilibrium. So only simulations with, with non-linear non perturbations will tell you whether the simulations make any sense, whether in nature such simulations, such results, such systems are realized. Okay. So that is one of the reasons right after writing my book, 1990, I started searching around the people to collaborate with, I myself never wanted to write any code myself because that is a whole lifetime job and if I am failure then I will be the uh, rest of my life I have nothing to do basically so I will not allow a generally a graduate student to start writing a code from scratch because it is an open-ended problem and he's, he's, he has to produce 4-5 papers within 4-5 years so but once he has some kind of uh, you know stability he got the degree and a postdoc something, at least he learns from some guru, like uh, Sudhik has learned a lot from um, Professor Balsara. And then you launch yourself, then you sort of have your own code and uh, try to uh, build up on it. So I have also, with Dinsha Balsara, uh, uh, we have worked very little, maybe the last few papers through the Sudhik Borai. But before that, I worked uh, with the Nataku Matsuda in Japan. That was my first trip to find out whether shocks exist. And then uh, he said, talked about Moldenin, so I came to Moldenin in Italy, and then I talked to, uh, he talked about Sponos, I went to Germany. So I have been looking for people who know uh, simulations to see whether such solutions are meaningful or not. Ultimately, those who use code was, was improved. We have our code of our you know, thesis of Inshugiri, Sudip Gorai, Himandri, and Orko Chatterjee, many people have built up, there are added varieties of subroutines to the basic TBD code. Even in astrobiology, we have used the TBD code. Uh, that was not uh, self priority but uh, again, we can have a self priority code. So, simulations are essential because many of the things you cannot do theoretically. Okay, so I, I will start the, uh, a few minutes uh, of my experience about the in, in hydrodynamic simulation. Then after that, I will hand over to uh, Professor Balsara to talk about the uh, his uh, most advanced code, and you will you will see how how difficult it is to write, and uh, you will be able to appreciate uh, uh, the simulations once you hear it. Now I am not a first time code writer, but because I don't, as I said, I am I am more inclined towards the theoretical solutions and try to see if the codes can be run to prove or disprove the solutions. So I already theoretically we already discussed many times in this particular audience that we have a star and from the star the matter usually comes to the Rosh globe and it, it comes very close to the black hole. Now if it is if it comes if it is highly discussed it will come along the equatorial plane and if it comes from the wings 
it will come away from the equatorial plane. So there are more, there are two uh, components, capillarian uh, and subcapillarian. And subcapillarian component will produce shocks. We produce something called same ball, same if you have been dominated boundary layer, and this itself in, a mind, in our um, solution, and that is the is the common cloud which which increases the soft photon from here and reprocesses and produces the hard state. So when I see the spectrum, I see the directly radiation from this disk which is soft state, and also reprocess this uh, reprocess photon which is hard state. Of course, the same ball is also the hottest region and it produces the jets. We also wanted to, to prove with Sudip and uh, Professor Balsara that a lot of new magnetic fields, toroidal fields can escape from the same ball and the uh, same ball it, it can come out and then ultimately it can collimate the jet, it can accelerate the jet and they are ultimately of course it terminates into a power shot. So origin of origin, collimation and acceleration, all the three problems can be sorted out if we have only toroidal field, but not too strong. If the, if there are very strong field here, then it will just be buoyant and it will get out. Because the buoyancy in the magnetic field is highly buoyant, just like there are partner instabilities on the case of in the case of sun. So this was our first simulation in, in, in 1993. You can see the one-dimensional simulation. We predicted the shock should be forming here. This is supersonic branch, this is subsonic branch. And it ultimately, you can see that the shock forms somewhere here, and it went back, and it, it started, it stopped here. That is that is why we, we realize that the shock solution is correct, and and matter does stop very close to stop in close to the black hole. This is very exciting because it is only 23 Schwarzschild radius away, namely few hundred kilometer away. Matter it doesn't want to fall. Centrifugal force is so strong. Very exciting. The, paper, the, the, the barrage of papers we started writing. This was the first paper on numerical simulation with Diego Montani that numerical simulation confronts theory. Of course, the, by, the, all this matter came from some binary companion. And this is a 1 is to 1, let us say. The, here you can see, I, I don't know, this one has some, does it have a laser J, J or some laser D pointer? I don't know. So there should have been a laser pointer. Right? This is 1 is to 1. And one is to one, we have a bonus of constant, bonus of constant uh, potential energy, and you can see matter is going, matter can go from one to the other. The, and this is one is to five. So suppose there is a high mass excited binary, matter will be coming from here and it will go to the black hole. If it's a low mass excited binary, you can just invert the uh, picture, and then this matter will come from this object to this object. Okay. M1 and M2 will just be reversed. So if you see the new, if you do the numerical simulation, these simulations we started because we wanted to write a book and I wanted to add a lot of real simulations in the book. You can see that the matter, which is, uh, you know, this is the matter which is coming from the um, uh, high mass and it is falling onto this small black hole, okay? And forming a disk and L L1 and this L2, there are some mass loss. You can see the modules of constant if you put the Roche uh, you know, potentials, and uh, uh, you can also see that the. So, thanks. So, so the first one. The first one. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. So, you can see the matter, you can see that the matter is falling onto the uh, secondary star and very bright object, and matter is lost by in L, L, L2. So, matter is passing through L1, and some matter is lost through. L2. Now this is a still picture. Okay, so this is how you see that the accretion disk is formed from a, a high mass excited binary. You can see the details here. The matter is crossing the Lagrange point and it is produced with this spiral shock. And uh, then <coughs> shock because of the <coughs> this matter, this matter which is coming here, due to Coriolis force. See, it is supposed the bow moving train it could have gone to the straight line if this object will be. On the, uh, this is always in the same line, the co moving frame, uh, but matter is feeling, say, uh, you know, that Coriolis force. So matter is bending due to Coriolis force, and this matter coming back and beating itself, so it produces a shock. You can see that it is going up to the potential barrier, that barrier, and bounces back from the barrier, so that keeps the matter within the potential value. Okay, so that leads to why accretion is matter is not just diverting, it is going away. 
because it is trying to go away, but it is deleted in that. So this is an interesting simulation. This is also another simulation from uh, you can see that the raw flow is the initial condition we started from the raw flow, and uh, I hope it starts. Or I don't know if I have to click. <coughs> Oh, yeah. So the, if, the, if the wind is very hot, you can see that it is getting scattered and it's coming out of the potential well and no accretion disk is actually formed. So the, although this shows not everybody is going to form an accretion disk, here you can see M1 equal to 1, M2 equal to 10 solar mass. Now, in, in two dimensional also, of course, we started doing this to shock long time ago, 19, uh, 1994, and you can see that the shock has formed. This is red means subsonic, blue means supersonic. And the matter this time is becoming a very good uh, outflow, and you can see that the matter is entering into black hole subsonic, uh, subsonically, sorry, supersonically, a little bit of green, uh, blue here. Okay, so if you, of course, if I increase the angular momentum, more matter will come out of the as the wind. So, this is another case of the low angular momentum where the wind is not very high because you can see that the centrifugal barrier is also very weak, and the wind is also very weak. So, uh, angular momentum namely the potential barrier is the culprit to produce wind and then once you have wind you can collimate it through a magnetic um, uh, torado field and then accelerate also through the com rocket recombination or squeezing the magnetic field very quickly. So these results were already we did it in this paper, IP paper, Monthly in and Chakravarti 1994. And then we, we did large number of simulations to try to find out exactly at what conditions this jet will form, shock will form, whether the theory is valid or not. And we found generally the theory is valid, except that theory was written only for very model, more, uh, ideal models like conical or vertical equilibrium, but these are not ideal models, these are all free. So you can read the speed to expand and so on. So the, the location of the shock a little bit behind the, the location that we, we, we predicted. Now two dimension is fine. And we also proved prove that if we have viscosity, very large viscosity, then the uh, matter will become, this uh, will become Keplerian, and it may also produce, uh, for weak viscosity, it will produce, still produce shock. This is the simulation by Kishu Giri and myself, 2013, and here we showed that if the viscosity goes down steadily, then there is a, a strong, beautiful Keplerian disk forms here, and there is a sub-Keplerian flow, there is same ball here with a high density region. So, every, all the components that we envisaged we theoretically could be proven by numerical simulation. And on the top of this, Sudhi Purai does the, did the Monte Carlo simulation and as well as the magnetic field he added, and also Hinoji Rose also added Monte Carlo simulation. So, and, uh, and we have another student, Rondo Bhattacharya, no, 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 Obisha Bhattacharya also uh, proved something very exciting that it is very easy to produce. Keplerian disk, but very difficult to destroy it. because um, destruction required if you have to turn off the viscosity and then the matter uh, the Keplerian disk can destroy only through turbulence diffusion, it takes a longer time. So I can prove that also. That also. So this is a simulation by Gini Chakraborty. It is a very interesting simulation in the major paper, major result of his theory of his um, thesis. In fact, the speaker also allowed him to write a book. And the thesis book, we also got awarded probably some the books with a handsome amount of euros. We got very rich, not so not, not very much fun. Here, at this point, we all of the our Bhattacharya, and this is Gideon Chakravarti. No, this one is Gideon Chakravarti, but this result is uh, on of on of um, and uh, uh, we say Roy, sorry, we say Roy and myself. The, so, here you can see that the Kepler, this is very easy to form. But, but if you turn off the viscosity, it takes a long time for the Kepler to go away. Very exciting result because still, but because observationally we see this. It is called hysteresis effect. Okay. It is very interesting that the, dynamically you produce a Kepler disk just by just by removing the angular momentum by adding a lot of viscosity. As soon as you turn off the viscosity, it doesn't know what to do. Okay. It, it can neither fall, it can neither go away. So on the other hand, the Kepler Kelmos instability. On the top of these two layers, two flare, two sorry, this 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 is virtually not moving. This is a tree falling, so there is a minimum instability. Will slowly eat up the matter. Okay, so it takes a long time to destroy the cable, and this is exactly the time scale we see theoretically, observationally, 
that the uh, this is the soft shell is formed and it takes a long time for the soft shell to go ahead. Okay, very exciting. So we, be, we basically understood everything and thankfully without using magnetic field. This one will be very bad, but I myself have not used much magnetic field yet and we have been able to still understand most of the things about the observation. This is the first paper, also one of the first papers with Matsuda, where the, the, we, can, we showed that the um, your um, companion uh, was uh, giving tidal force, so obviously you will produce this spiral shock. Okay, these beautiful spiral shocks are produced always at a larger scale. But the, what the shock I am talking about is extremely close to the center because in this case, this is about 100, this is about 60,000 social decades, and I am talking about the shock 10 social decades. So it, it, resolution is not enough. So resolution of Chakraborty Matsuda is not enough to capture the shock obtained in the Chakraborty Molden simulation. So that simulation is the outer boundary is at 30 social areas or 100 social areas. Here the outer boundary is 60,000 60, social areas. So simulation that could not capture the both types of shocks, but nevertheless we found that these two types of shocks exist. And in the meantime, of course, it also, those shocks also move around and produce variabilities. We wrote some paper that if AGM variability or the small uh, daytime variability, these are, you can see that four spirals, four become three, three become four. So we also found out, and then later we realized that the possibility of oscillation three is to oscillation is related to the formation of the shock. Three, three arm become two arm, two arm becomes three arm again. So this variability is observed, and we also wrote a paper with Paul Wita. So Paul Wita, we wrote a few papers to, to prove that why AGMs are variable. We showed that they are variable because of the spiral shock and the spiral shocks as they move in, move around and is enough, the radiation is enough and changed so that within, within a day you could see, see some changes. So this paper is well cited by a lot of people. Another paper is well cited even today is the variability of line emission. This is the iron the hydrogen emission line. You can see that sometimes you see a red, red shifted component is, uh, is weaker than the blue shifted component. And this is the main component, and sometimes the same object we see red shifted component much stronger. So that is the, this this going up and down is a very good is can be explained very well by assuming spiral shock. And we and this paper is also very well cited even today. Um, uh, uh, taken to be the, this is the reason why all the variables are observed. Now, if I consider now to my simulation, uh, just to give you an idea of what is happening. The recent things, uh, I don't know whether it starts automatically or I have to not share. Uh, no, no, it started already. So you can see that the matter from the companion actually it, it produces a steady matter. This is called a pile of radius. From there, matter is lost, and that matter then breaks into Keplerian and sub -Keplerian. And if this is the same ball, same ball produces a J. And so you, when you have an outburst, this is exactly what you see in an outburst. Matter actually comes out, you can see this upper and Keplerian and this is in one. And you can see the repeated outburst can happen. And you look at the what happens to the halo rate, the shock location, the disk rate, etc. So this is exactly what happens in an outburst in a, in a, uh, in a black hole. Okay? So there is oscillatory, oscillatory symbol produces QPOs. And then that's uh, then QPO, if you can see it's smaller and smaller, at the same ball goes out. And so this matter is coming from the, you can see I'm trying to simulate a little bit. Uh, you can see that the matter is coming out of this companion with wind, stripping from the Rostov overflow. So the next one is of course it is just oscillation is shown that the that this symbol not only moves like that, it actually oscillates on the way, and that oscillation creates the uh, the, the, the possibility of oscillation, QPO that we observe. And this QP frequency goes up and up and up as this as this fellow moves in. So um, this is precisely what in our um, model in our solution uh, is what is happening close to a black hole. Again, we did not use so far a magnetic field. We have also done uh, fittings. I will not go into the fitting part, but that is one thing. The, another thing, the people ask a very interesting question. That for a high mass X ray binary, we know that a lot of wings are produced from the company, yeah? and therefore it is easy to understand why, how zero angular momentum matter can fall onto the black hole, low angular momentum matter. 
But for a lower sex level anatomy, which is supposed to be the first into the rostrum, if we expect that only kept in this will form, because it's passing through rostrum, then we have a very high amount of momentum, and therefore, why is it that we require subcapitalian flow? Okay, this is very exciting. I want to prove here that independent of whether it's a low mass sexual binary or high mass sexual binary, subcapitalian flow is always there. Okay, this is my proof. So, so let us try to calculate the, let, let us try to do the simulation where matter is coming from the companion. And this is the simulation, very low uh, angular momentum of the thing. You can you can see that. So this is the uh, this is the time passing by. You can see the, the angular momentum, the average angular momentum of the action D is okay. And the matter is coming from the high mass X binary. So everybody knows, and this is the Keplerian distribution. So you can see that the high mass X binary matter, which is coming to close to the black hole, this is black hole sitting here. Angular momentum is much lower compared to the Keplerian. And people will then me that because people know that it is coming from the wind from all directions and they will cancel each other. Net angular momentum is very little and therefore angular momentum is lower than the Keplerian. But so this is what is uh, let us do the following for totally different reasons. Now, if I if I consider low mass X ray binary, okay, I have uh, the sequence is a little bit different. So look at the low mass X ray binary, which is supposed to be a, a loss of overflow. So loss of overflow is happening. Let us uh, so let it ro rotate towards you, and then you will see there is an addition disk has formed. But look at the matter which is coming from all the, all over directions and also gets captured by the high mass X ray, uh, high mass black hole. So low mass companion is producing within all over directions. They could have gone to any direction, but all of them, most of them, are captured by the high mass X ray, by high mass companion. So high mass companion, namely the black hole. Is so massive that it is not allowing the matter from uh, matter or wind coming from the low mass uh, companion. So, low mass companion is sending matter through the loss flow. So, you get the capital in this. It is also capturing the winds above and below, and therefore, you get my other component. So, this is my this is basically my challenge that low mass X binary is also producing uh, the two to component flow. People are writing me for IMI, high mass, but this is the real actual simulation where you can see that the load M2 is 1, M1 is 10. Now, so this is the angular momentum distribution, and that is the, the this is low mass X binary angular momentum distribution. What happens is you can see that it is rotating and it is also getting captured, and ultimately the disk is produced, and then you will see above and below two layers like theta. Okay, so this is much larger length scale. This is the length scale of the size of the binary. You will not see the attrition shock in, from sideways. You can see that the uh, uh, disk has formed. So, if you see from close by, you will see the same thing. Matter is coming like this L1 bound back and back, and then also some matter is of course, this is, a, this is a tutorial plan. So, you won't be able to see the uh, matter which is coming out in this particular picture. Uh, here, again, on the tutorial plan, you can see that the matter is entering into the uh, into the uh, potential well, and at the same time, you have this. So, this is the angular momentum. Uh, you can see the matter is falling into the potential well of the, of the uh, massive black hole. Okay, and this is the this is the uh, companion, low mass, low mass companion. Some matter is lost from here, but most of the matter is coming from here. Now, if I go to the other object, okay, let us try to go to the object which is um, high mass X binary. I, I, I hope this is for high mass. Then we will find out. I have written and they have written this is lower. They can be the water wind, the angular momentum will go even further. You can see that this is the this is this this action, most of the uh, angular momentum of the flow in the this is the average angular momentum. Look at this average angular momentum of matter falling onto a black hole. Okay, this is low mass x binary. So, average angular momentum is still much lower compared to the Kepler in this. So, if you are always worried that low mass X binary is sending huge amount of matter through the loss flow, so the biggest problem is how to remove this viscosity, how, how to remove this angular momentum. Problem is wrong because it is all E post. The problem is that if you are not injecting high mass, high, high angular momentum matter. If you take care of the fact that not only the, uh, from the L1, you also get the matter from the surface. Average angular momentum is really much lower compared to close to the black hole. It is very close to the Keplerian. You can see. 
Okay, so centrifugal barrier will form and everything that I say will happen. True. So <clears throat> this is my therefore challenge that that uh, for either for uh, long mass accelerator or for uh, see look at this it remains below the Kepler here and that is good enough to produce your shock and produce the jet and the same same ball etc. Even for long mass accelerator. Here you can see that this is for high mass accelerator. We know that it is high shock Kepler here. One is to one, so don't ignore these fellows also. There are objects again. This it is very similar to the high mass accelerators, and for low mass accelerators, it is yes, it is very close to the Kepleriyan, but very high is the Kepleriyan. So in outside, so suppose the same ball is here, the object is definitely the matter is definitely the Kepleriyan. So this is a very major result, which shows that if I take the entire system, I I obtain. Uh, <coughs> now uh, I can keep on taking the uh, let us say viscosity etc. and I can I can see that there are two states <coughs> shock oscillation or intensity cooling. You can change the cooling, you can change the viscosity, it will work in an opposite way. And if you go keep on increasing the cooling rate, then you can see that this uh, if you cool it high enough, then the shock will not oscillate, it will hang around at a given time place here. In the middle place, shock will oscillate. You will see lots of uh, uh, this is the you know all these spots. Location of all these shocks have been put at a given picture. So here you can see. So either you put a very high cooling, so shock doesn't have oscillation, or extremely low cooling, so that it is like a non-cooling disc, a periodic flow. And then in, in the middle, you will see all these oscillations. So it is either not not oscillating here or not oscillating at this end. But in between, the shock is oscillating and giving you the nucleus. Okay, so this is for this is true for the binary system. This is true for the actual clinic like also. Okay, so these are very major results and very powerful results. I will not have time to do. Okay, anyway, this is a very interesting. I wanted to prove the, how the shock actually oscillates in the same ball. Okay, so the same ball boundary may be oscillating, but what happens? Uh, what happens to the partner person? How the partner person actually moves in? And how the optical wave changes inside. Very exciting result. Only Kim Sung Giri may understand a little bit, but most certainly Bhujangal Dotto will understand more because it has to do with time lag. Sometimes you see the time lag. The because we have written paper on this that the time lag of the same ball is just published already. The time lag actually does not depend on the directly proportional to the Location of the shock. It is depending on the on what the optical depth inside is. So because there is a there is a phase lag when you are pulling the shock out doesn't mean the entire disc is going up. Some part of the disc doesn't even know that you have gone up. Okay. So if you integrate over the density and integrate over the optical depth, it may not be the largest. When the shock location is largest, the optical depth will not be the largest. So you need not have the fullest possible temperature. So that has been observed in all the objects. So that tells you that yes, QP not only is the oscillation of the shock, it also shows in the phenomena deep inside. So higher frequency, higher energy photons are coming from inner part of this, inner part of the same world. And how they are behaving, there is a cut off in the cut off in uh, energy beyond which it behaves one way and it behaves other way, uh, a cut off energy. And that cut off energy is possible because shock is also you can see the location of the shock is oscillating like this. But that does not mean the optical depth is oscillating exactly in the same way. So very interesting solution I found uh, much more detail. You can see that the colors are colors are switching, not in the same sequence. So that tells you that the optical depth. This is the total optical depth, right? So total optical depth has nothing to do with the location of the shock. Not exactly in the proportional way. So this is what I have to say. We have done a large number of simulations, and uh, when we flip the data. With four parameters, two branches, two activation rates, location of the shock, and the compactness, it usually fits the data. Not only that, we also get the mass of the black hole. Now, uh, our student um, Abhijit has uh, written a very good potential um, with spin, and we are we are going to have spin extracted. And uh, we, but I don't expect that the mass to change very much because we have used the mass, obtained the mass using the hard states, and hard states have to send ball very far away from the black hole. So it is independent of 
play dragging of inner self and goes to the dark. So that is all I have to say. Okay. So you may question very quickly, otherwise I will hand over to Professor Balsar. Uh, how about spin? I mean, the spin in you know, many of your symbols, the spin is absent. No? Uh, I mean, uh, from black holes have spin. Yeah, from black holes have majority of the black holes have. No, no, no. I did not answer that particular because I have not answered in the discussion session. Uh -huh. The as I said that the, if you feed the data with the hard states, mm -hmm. then it does not change the uh, inner part of the disk. Okay. Yeah. Hard states, you send all these letters say 30, 40, 50, even 20, 30, 40, 50, 50, even at 200 square centimeters away. Yeah. So it does not matter whether the black hole size is 2 gm by 6 square or gm by 6 square. It does not matter whether the couple of square centimeters matter is doing diagonal in a cell frame. But if you are trying to feed the soft state, mm -hmm. okay, you may remember Narayan and Macintosh and company yeah. who wanted to explain. Yeah. Where if you want to explain, you cannot use hard state. Yes. That is zero number one. Yeah. Why do you mean? Using hard state, you cannot use the spin. If you want to probe the spin, you probe closer to the black hole, soft state plus full state. Yes. So, do it. now, soft state, if it's a temporary at least, then the actual circular spin at least is good enough to feed, to feed it one component. Okay, yes. so I don't need two components. Right now, what we will be doing is, with the uh, object, we are now trying to uh, jack up the code, improve the code, mm -hmm. so that we extract the mass and the spin, mm -hmm. and go as close to the soft state as possible. Instead of, so soft intermediate state we will feed mm -hmm. and as you come closer and closer to the softer state we start, we start finding that spin is becoming a non-zero entity and is a good entity. So in the hard state we will not be, it is not sensitive to the spin. But the high frequency people like 60, 70 hertz people, these are seen in soft state? No, so high frequency you use are not very high, it is only 60, 70. 60, 70. Yes, 60, 70 is not a large number. If you want to see a hard high frequency of proven neutron stars, thousand, I see. thousand, uh, yeah, thousand, yeah. Proof, proof. nine hundred. Yeah. So they are the, uh, the boundary layer of the neutron star, the very yes, thin, mm -hmm. very thin. Yes, yes. That layer actually oscillates, and therefore it oscillates at thousand million, thousand hertz. Mm -hmm. In our case, making seventy hertz mm -hmm. out of my, uh, our shop, the shop is yeah. not No, 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 we can do that. We can do that. Maybe for the mass. Uh, for the uh, feeding the data, when you feed the data, because as you know, mm -hmm. from our symbol location, we can also calculate the QQ frequency. Yes. But it does not count the spin mm -hmm. So, the inform velocity that is used to find out the inverse of the time scale, that inform velocity has to be changed, adding the spin effect. You see, you see. So, when I calculate the inform time, I must have the spin inside, mm -hmm. then only the QQ frequency will, will come correctly. Yeah. So we can we have a way to um, uh, feed the data, uh, you know, during the rising state and the, uh, the uh, state. But we need to include the spin. See, that's propagation of oscillatory swap model. That is not a that is a different model. That is a propagation of oscillatory swap yes, model. Yes. Uses a velocity profile. Uh -huh. Here we don't use a velocity profile. Here velocity profile is generated. It is coming up. Yes. It is, I mean, it is coming out or natural. So these are two different models, but we can handle it. We are very close to handling it. I am requesting, I am requesting work much faster, it's 10 times faster than what he is doing today. So that is his problem. I have to uh, get very little time. So any more question? Sir, the symbols are you in the last two slides. Yes. Are they accessible or? No, none of the uh, no, no, it is three dimensional. This is no, this is from the axis metric simulation. This is from the axis metric simulation to the to the uh, uh, I mean, uh, on the stage to the stage. The reason is that I have also three D. I have already shown in three D simulation. But but the uh, particle size was chosen to be so big. See, this is three D simulation. But partly size is you can look at the look at the radial distance. This is the radial distance in terms of the interstellar uh, distance and binary binary distance. No binary separation. So I have to choose. Look at the point here. I look at these numbers. The, so zero to two is one quarter of the binary separation. I have chosen. Of course, every fourth point, fourth or fifth point, just to be able to plot it. But you can see that this is like a like 100 or 1000 swarsi radius 
and even <coughs> so the uh, SPH particles have to be chosen very big. Mm -hmm. So it will wash out my shock. Okay. So this this is necessarily a three-dimensional but very large, very crude um, uh, A, you know, the crude the size of the grid. Uh, so this is a big problem. We can in future we can discuss right in our discussion section. Of course, there are multiple multiple grid and other things with so must be uh, using or uh, definitely using. So these are the only ways where we can take the start with the boundary company and, and then do it and then change see the boundary and you know and then replace it and then so that we capture from the same flow we also capture the inner shock and put the relative transfer get the uh, spectrum every detail of spectrum is coming up including the phase lag and time lag and intricacies they uh, with Gopal, I have written maybe four five papers on that last few years. So the, all these integrations are, all are possible, uh, are, are coming up to be true. So generally people don't use solutions. Generally people think that no, 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 this is too complicated. Let us put by hand 10 parameters and we fill the data go home. But we did not want to do that. We thought that no, nature is very kind. Nature is generally honest. And we should be able to have only the equations and the solutions and the, that should be enough to fill the data. Okay, and we, we are successful in that. This is my point. So maybe we have to increase one or two more parameters, uh, like spin. But spin is not our parameter. Spin is the parameter, is the parameter of the system. See, if we added some property of the flow, that will be our uh, hand waving. But if the black hole has a mass, so it is not a parameter. It has a spin, it is not a parameter. This is the intrinsic property of the, similar the distance of the black hole. It is not, a, it is not our problem, it, it is there. That distance is there, so it is not a parameter. Similarly, there is a normalization. The black hole is there, our instrument is this UD, so there is, a, there is a ratio between the. So, and the theory is saying that no, your instrument should have been this big, but I am sending a this UD instrument, so there must be a ratio between the flux that is coming here and the flux that we are actually watching through the instrument. Okay, so theoretically, we make a model, we assume a distance. This many, this area should have been this amount of flux. So to do that, we have to uh, take care of the fact that the instrument itself is also, you know, it has a finite size and if it is very big, it may capture too many photons and then you say, no, your theory is wrong, I have a very large flux. Not because of my theory is wrong, your instrument is true. Okay, so therefore, both of both theory and the experiment have to come, come back to per square centimeter basis. That is the factor of normalization. So normalization is not, is not our parameter. It is a parameter between if it has to do the distance of the object and the instrument that I am using to capture the programs. Okay. So the, therefore those parameters are not the real parameter. What bothers me is that you could use 29 physical parameters. Size of the disk, inner edge of the disk, outer edge of the disk, some compound cloud, light post somewhere. All this garbage is there, which makes it link with the um, uh, parameters which we don't have to use. Okay. Intrinsic parameters is our, our control. Distance is there. Object has a mass. Object has a speed. That is what we will uh, But those parameters, I am saying that those are not the parameters. That is the system we are starting. Okay. So that I think that I have taken a lot of time. Okay. Professor Balsara, please. So how are you going to start from there? Uh, I could start from here. Please, please go ahead. Able to, is this being broadcast? Uh, yes, yes, I think so. A broadcast which is okay. Yes, yes. But it's being broadcast yes. from there, right? Yes, yes. So I can talk from my computer and not a problem. But no, no, no uh, you can talk, but your 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 screen has to be uh, uh, I have to stop my presentation. So I stop sharing. So I sharing stop. Now you you get into the okay, Google okay. Meet. Yes. No. Get, get into the Google Meet. I don't have Google Meet. That's the problem. Really? So I can actually then give my you can give, you get that day. give my presentation to you and then yeah, I can give you the talk from your computer. Yeah. So, so um, uh, Google Meet. So I have to start. Hey, I'm going to get out of the bag. I don't have to start again. Yeah. 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 Oh, it will be there except that it will be coming my name. 
That's fine. That's fine. People don't mind. So um, uh, let us see. Yes, give me volume. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned I'm going to do this, so we go down to the PowerPoint. Oh, this is on, yeah. Okay, so it is there. Uh, I have to close this, this one, okay. and then I say stop share, and I say start sharing. Yeah, that's let me just see, see the talk in case. And let's go down. Yeah, you know, I don't know. No, 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 go from there because I go from here. Go from there. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's 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 that might. Okay, I think we're good. We're good. Good now. The equation is fine. So yeah. let me start uh, sharing. And just a moment. So start sharing in the screen. Then uh, screen number one. Yeah, yeah, then view slide. So start from the bottom slide. So uh, just one little bit more. Oh, I have to close this. That's it. Okay. So now the okay. Okay. I can so move on. It's hard for that. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure and an honor to be talking at uh, this very august institution led by our own very august scientist, Professor Sandeep Chakrabarty. Um, I wish you had talked for maybe 15 minutes more to the time we have enough. I won't have to do the talk at all. <laughs> so, um, no, that takes you that you can, get, you can go ahead for three more. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I only gave you the idea. How many times you can go and get it? <laughs> okay. So, uh, I want to talk about uh, some new styles and thinking about uh, uh, MHD simulations. Uh, specifically applying it to the modeling of massive stars in three dimensions uh, and uh, focusing on the simulation of the magne magnetic O star. Uh, I, I, Sudeep uh, Garen was actually very helpful at uh, the early stages of the uh, work, but uh, uh, in recent years, uh, a very good student, of, a graduate student of mine by the name of Seto Subramaniam has taken over and really done an excellent job of this. So, and I'd also like to thank my other collaborators in this effort. Um, so how do I go down? No, no, no. You have this remote? No. Okay, I see. So you use the remote. I, I think so. Yeah, how do I go? Hello. 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 Uh, the mesh imprinting that goes on when you simulate astrophysical systems with meshes that are inherently Cartesian. So if you simulate something with r theta phi geometry, then of course when you get close to the uh, pole of the simulation, you actually run into problems with time step becoming very small, you run into problems associated with accuracies at this pole becoming very small, we'd like to run into heating uh, fictitious heating and we also have divergence problems at the pole. So my, for, for a while, my thinking had been that what if we could actually move from simulations that are con 
uh, conducted in RTFE geometry, two simulations that are conducted in a much more favorable geometry where the sphere is uniformly map mapped over its surface, then, then in that case we can do a lot better. So um, I'm interested in accretion disks, jets, uh, star and planet formation, but most importantly today I'll be talking about magnetospheres of stars and uh, not planets, but magnetospheres of stars. Uh, but you can actually go ahead and deal with problems as, uh, involving convection of stars, uh, possible accretion on stars, neutron star uh, collisions, etc. Uh, and because we're interested in turbulence also, uh, we want to do very high order astrophysical MHD uh, with a, a focus on doing it in optim opt optimally in spherical systems. So with that, the outline of the talk is that I'll be talking about uh, geodesic meshes and their advantages and the challenges of meshing the sphere. Then I'll be talking about high accuracy divergence free magnetohydrodynamics on geodesic meshes, uh, talking about some algorithmic advances and Sudeep was very helpful in this. Um, and then we'll be talking about basics of radiation driven winds and massive stars. Uh, and this is actually the boundary where Setu took over and did an excellent job. Um, and um, then we'll be talking about the physics of simulations. We'll be talking about three important parameters that regulate the physics of this problem. Uh, we'll be talking about mass loss and approach to quasi steady state. Then we'll be go going into movie mode. Uh, so we'll be talking about movies. Um, and uh, then we'll talk about mass and anti momentum loss and come up with conclusions. <clears throat> so, um, Nothing going to do at this point. No, no, okay. So, don't no, worry, no, it's okay. Uh, so, okay, so suppose I want to, that's fine, some of the pictures I've got a little bit oh. shaken up. Um, suppose we want to actually simulate um, astrophysical problems, but we want to cover the sphere absolutely uniformly. Then how could we do that? The answer like, was given to us by Plato himself. Uh, by because you can have, have these platonic solids. These are uh, something like six uh, uh, perfect solids that can actually map a sphere in the best of ways. And imagine if you like that I took this icosahedron and I blew it up, I inflated it so that it actually becomes a spherical icosahedron. <coughs> and on the surface of this spherical icosahedron, I have essentially 20 large triangles. These are the largest possible geodesic triangles that you can form on the surface of a sphere and that is why we call it geodesic mesh simulations. And with these you can actually now imagine that each of these arcs of, a, of, of the spherical triangle makes a, a, is part of a great circle which makes an angle, angle of about 64 degrees at the center of the sphere. And now imagine if you like that I go ahead and subdivide this particular triangle into four sub-triangles. Then each sub-triangle will make an, will subtend an angle of about 32 degrees. But I continue this process onwards and onwards. <coughs> if I continue this process several times, then I can actually arrive at a mesh where you have no coordinate singularity either at the North Pole or the South Pole. And the angle, angular resolution of this mesh can be made as fine as possible. In fact, um, some of the sim simulations that Seto is doing now are sub arc second simulations. <coughs> and with those, you can actually achieve some very good results. <coughs> so once you cover the sphere, you can actually extend it in the third direction, in the radial direction. And therefore, you can actually obtain a three dimensional mesh. And once you have a three dimensional mesh, <coughs> you can actually do much better. Sandeep, can I have some more? Yes, that's me. We just did. Thank you very much. Now, where we are right now is actually doing cube sphere meshes, which are, in fact, superior to the meshes that we had before. <coughs> So, with this sort of mesh, we can actually imagine that the sphere is split up into six sectors. There's one, two, three, four, five sectors, and there's a sector behind it. And associated with each of these sectors, we can actually inflate the sector outward so as to actually obtain two-dimensional meshes. I'm only able to show you four of them. 
but you can actually go ahead and imagine that there's one mesh in front of you and one mesh behind you. <coughs> and with this mesh structure, we can actually go ahead and map the elements. So for example, for the uh, triangular meshes that I showed you, each triangle on the surface of a sphere is actually curved and we use isoparametric mapping to enable us to go from <coughs> a flat triangle to a spherically curved triangle. So this is a, a isoparametric mapping, that's one of the technology elements. Now, the goal, the gold standard with respect to spherical uh, with, with respect to MHG simulations is to actually do the simulation in a divergence-free fashion, namely the magnetic fields are Magnetic field components are located at the boundaries of the mesh and uh, they're updated using electric fields at the edges of the mesh. And what we have done is we have built technologies that make it possible for us to actually solve the problem even on curved spherical meshes. And that is an important thing. Well, thank you so much. Here you don't have like triangles. Yeah, there are rectangles, and that actually helps us because you have much more uniform structure. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Uh, so uh, we, we've made very significant advances, and this is actually uh, something that uh, um, is uh, very good work that Sethu has done recently with me, where he has shown that instead of working on CPUs, uh, so the CPU speed is shown on this axis, you can actually work on GPUs. And because we have GPU ready codes, we can actually go ahead and work on hundreds of GPUs and get results that are about five to 10 times faster than the results that you can obtain on a CPU. So it actually enhances your ability to kind of resolve the problem very dramatically. So, and these, these meshes are all in some sense, logically cubed cube-like meshes, so they're logically as close as possible that you can obtain to our Taylor fee meshes without necessarily suffering from the singularities that you have at the North and South Pole. So with this, uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump into uh, talking about uh, winds around massive stars. Well, what is the fundamental difference between the wind around a massive star and the wind around our sun, for example? Uh, the, the issue here is that around our sun, our sun also emits a wind, but it's 10 raised to minus 14 solar masses per year. And therefore, if you ask what, how much wind will be emitted uh, over the lifetime of the sun, over a uh, uh, assumed 10 billion year lifetime of the sun, uh, we will, the sun will lose only about 0.01% of its mass. However, if you have uh, so it's something that says that your laptop battery is low. If you have, on the other hand, um, a massive star, a massive star typically loses 10 raised to minus 6 solar masses per year, which means that over an assumed lifetime of about 10 million years, it will actually lose about 50% of its initial mass. And that matters because when you start with, for example, a 40 solar mass star, a massive star that has 40 solar masses, if it were to lose 50% of its solar mass, uh, of its mass to wind, wind activities, then by the time it's ready to end its life as a supernova, you would only have a supernova from a 20 million, uh, 20 solar mass uh, star rather than a 40 solar mass star. So it makes a big difference as to how the star evolves because the star, these stars, these massive stars can lose more than 50% of their mass over the course of their lifetime. So, so it makes a difference as to when and how that star goes supernova uh, based on how much wind it can lose. Um, so, <coughs> we're interested in understanding that facet. And we're also interested in understanding massive stellar winds because these winds actually contribute very significantly to the mechanical outputs. <coughs> and they can also contribute very significantly to <coughs> the energetic output uh, that our interstellar the medium experiences from these stars. Um, and therefore, let's go ahead and 
uh, talk about what makes uh, the winds from our sun different from the winds coming out of massive stars so that you can actually understand why uh, these massive stars are such prodigious emitters of wind. <coughs> so for our sun, we all know that the sun heats up the corona of the sun and once, once you have a million degree corona, you actually uh, gently lift off a wind. How it heats up the corona, uh, specifically we do not know, but we expect that Magneto hydrodynamic processes and alpha and waves can actually contribute to that heating. But what makes a massive star different is that a massive star, for example, a 40 mass star, a 40 solar mass star can emit something like 10 raised to four times the luminosity of our sun. And because it has such a prodigious luminosity, you have the ability to radiatively just push to use radiative pressure to basically push the wind outwards. And that is why you have what is called Doppler shifted resonant absorption of UV radiation that causes the winds to form. So what actually happens in such a situation? The answer is that imagine a photon with a certain wavelength lambda zero coming out of the surface of the star. Now, if there's just a static layer on top of that star, what will actually happen is that you will have resonant absorption of that radiation. Um, I should mention that uh, um, you know you can have the, the gravity is sufficiently small at the surface of some of these massive supergiant uh, super stars, and the radiation is sufficiently strong at the surface of these supergiant stars that if you go just by Thomson scattering, you would have an Eddington factor that is close to unity. So there's not much opportunity for wind action to take place. But if you rely on resonant absorption of these lines, then you have a significant push, further push outwards, which actually drives the wind. But it has to be uh, considered or construed very specially because <coughs> if you imagine that this layer on top of the surface of the star is static, then what will happen is that the um, radiation will come into that layer, it will get uh, scattered and then you lose the directed aspect of the radiation so you get no further push from that material from that radiation and so layers on top of that layer will actually not feel a push what actually changes the picture quite dramatically <coughs> is the fact that the wind is actually moving relative to the star and therefore you have a Doppler shift a Doppler redshift between the photons that are coming out from the star and the photons that can actually be absorbed by the material in the wind. <coughs> so if you imagine a certain wavelength photon coming out from the surface of the, sun, of the star, then that wavelength, that wavelength photon as seen from the wind material is actually redshifted to a, uh, to a longer wavelength and then <coughs> At that longer wavelength, only some of the photons will be absorbed resonantly, and that is why you have a situation where if you have a further layer outside of that layer that you're considering, then there'll be a new set of photons that can actually pass right through this layer and be absorbed by that other layer. So it's basically because there's a velocity gradient in the star, in the wind itself, that makes it possible for different layers in the wind to actually absorb, uh, to resonantly absorb the, uh, the radiation coming from the star and therefore feel the radiation pressure. So our job in this talk is not to actually go ahead and go through those details, but rather to actually understand a more um, <coughs> intricate problem, which stems from the fact that about 10% of these massive OB stars actually possess extremely strong magnetic fields. And this, I mean, this is just a numerical coincidence, as I mentioned it, but um, <coughs> uh, about 10% of the uh, neutron stars that you find are actually classified as magnetars also. So it actually may relate to the fact that very strong magnetic fields uh, in these massive stars actually give rise to the magnetars. But the important thing is, <coughs> that you could have the possibility of uh, 
a very ro rapidly rotating massive star, and you could have the possibility of dynamo action taking place in the, uh, in the outer thin layer of convective zone that happens around the star. But you could also have the possibility that the core of the massive star is indeed convective and therefore can drive dynamo, dynamo action and give rise to a very strong magnetic field. You could also have the possibility that during the inner phases of the core collapse, the initial phases of the core collapse, you form a very strong, uh, you dredged in a very strong interstellar magnetic field to form the magnetic field associated with these massive stars. So what is the important um, and interesting aspect of this? Let's go ahead and consider a massive star with a magnetic field, uh, with a dipolar magnetic field as shown out here. Now, once you have a magnetic field, you have two possibilities. If the magnetic field is very weak, namely the ramp pressure of the, um, of the wind is stronger than the uh, 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 pressure and, and tension in the magnetic field, then what the, what the wind will do is it will basically blow up the magnetic field and the magnetic field, field lines will open up, this dipole will open up and you will not have a dipole anymore and the star will essentially send out uh, the wind. However, if your magnetic pressure becomes comparable or stronger than the ramp pressure in the wind, then you have the possibility that the curved field lines out here can actually curve the outflow that comes from the surface of the star and actually make the outflow collide in the equatorial plane of the dipole. So you have these uh, two flows basically being curved by the magnetic field because the magnetic field is strong. <clears throat> and they interact out here and they essentially form a bubble or a, or a growing lump of matter <coughs> in this region. So once you, once you have a strong uh, collection of matter, then the pressure of the, of the matter that is collected out here can episodically <coughs> become so strong as to basically blow out this material and essentially leak out of this closed field line and blow outward. So you have the possibility that uh, one important parameter has to do with the ratio of the magnetic field, uh, magne magnetic pressure to the ramp pressure of the gas that is coming out. And that important ratio we call a wind confinement, wind magnetic confinement parameter. And the important thing to realize is that that ratio is called data star in this talk <coughs> and it's given by these values but the important thing to realize is that this magnetic field is a dipolar magnetic field so it goes down as 1 over r2 so v squared goes down as 1 over r raised to 6. <coughs> For typical winds their velocity remains roughly constant once they've accelerated to their terminal speed <coughs> and so the only thing varying, or the only thing that can vary, is in fact the density which goes down is 1 over r cube, which basically means that there is always going to be some radius at which the magnetic field strength is not strong enough to overcome the ramp pressure. <coughs> and that radius we call the affine radius. So we have an interesting situation. We understand that there is going to be an affine radius, or Maybe if I could just stand here, that would be better. So we understand that there's going to be an alpha in radius. <laughs> it's okay, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll take care of it, no problem. So there's going to be some alpha in radius out to which the magnetic field says, no, everything is locked to me. And if I'm rotating, everything has to rotate with me. Okay? <coughs> if you go beyond that radius, the wind has escaped the clutches of the magnetic field and can easily go out those. But within that radius, everything re remains locked to the magnetic field. All right? So that's one parameter, and that parameter is the um, uh, magnetic confinement parameter. And we're going to have a factor that in. Now notice that as the magnetic field increases, this affine radius increases. So as the magnetic field becomes stronger, it can lock in the wind at larger radius. So that is one consideration. But the wind itself is also a result of the accretion anyway. Right? I'm sorry? Wind is also a, a result of the accretion anyway. So matter which came, 
Maybe a few percentage became only. So when it came back, many of these stars don't have a, 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 a source of accretion around them. So this matter which is coming, no, there's no matter coming. Matter. So, so what you plotted is actually the, just the This is not an accretion disk. This is actually confined matter. Confined. No, 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 no. There's no companion, sorry. No, no, confined matter due to this. Yes. So, so it does form a little disk-like structure and every once in a while, the pressure in this disk-like structure can build up. So once it builds up, it will episodically try to flow out. <coughs> but if it cannot build up that pressure, it will also fall back down upon the star itself. Okay. So you, I'll, I'll show you simulations that uh, kind of illustrate that point. Uh, so with this, we understand that there's going to be another entity, and that kind of consists of saying how fast can you make a star spin before it breaks up? And the answer is that your centrifugal forces become comparable to the gravitational forces and at that point you cannot hold on to the star. That's not what we're going to be concern concerned with. But let's say that you have a source, another source of spinning up the wind material that is coming out of the star. In that case you can ask the question, what is the ratio of the actual spin of the star to the critical spin with which the, uh, the material is moving. So if the magnetic field manages to make the material spin with it, then at some point the centrifugal forces on that material will basically be powerful enough to push it outwards. So there's another ratio that comes up which is the ratio of the actual spin of the star to the critical spin of the star and now notice that you have centrifugal forces that increase with radius, but the gravitational force actually decreases with radius. So it basically means that for all radii beyond a certain radius, if you can make the matter spin or co-rotate with the stock, if you can do that, then the matter is naturally going to be flung outwards by centripetal forces. Okay? So the, the, the two radii, the, this other radius is called the Keplerian radius. And notice that as you spin up the star, the Keplerian radius comes inwards. Okay? And of course, the most important aspect is the aspect of three-dimensionality. Okay? Because you cannot always be sure that your spin axis for the star and the dipole axis are going to be aligned. So all of this stuff about spin axis and dipole axis being aligned is just a theorist's fantasy. What actually happens is that you have a spin axis, which in this talk will always be along the z direction, and you have a rotation, uh, or and you have a dipole axis, which will be uh, oblique to the uh, rotation axis by an angle that is given by zeta. And we want to actually understand the real situation where you can have any spin direction and any magnetic dipole directions. Okay, so now let's just take stock of things. We're interested in uh, simulating uh, a system called Zeta Pop, which is an O4 supergiant. It has a luminosity that is around 10 raised to four times the luminosity of our sun, and a temperature that is about 40,000 degrees Kelvin. And it has a gigantic surface magnetic field uh, measured in kilocouts. So about a hundred times larger than the mean magnetic field on our sun. <coughs> and it rotates with a rotational period of just 1.2 days, which means that it's all, almost halfway to Keplerian rotation. <coughs> and we're essentially interested in these three parameters. So let's just recap as as the magnetic confinement parameter goes up, the field radius, namely the radius out to which the matter is confined, goes up. <coughs> we also have the Keplerian radius, which basically says that as the star spins up, the Keplerian radius, which is the radius from out of which everything, outwards of which everything can be flung outwards, this Keplerian radius comes inwards. Okay? And we also need to consider the aspect of three-dimensionality 
because we live in a three-dimensional world, world and we can't all just keep doing uh, simulations in two dimensions to the end of days. So let's go ahead and therefore focus on what happens in all these three different situations. So imagine if you like that a star is actually rotating very slowly. In that case, the rotation doesn't play much of a role. And therefore, you have a situation where the Keplerian radius is very far out and the alphaean radius is, let's say, here. In that case, the alphaean radius and the magnetic field will keep the star, uh, keep the matter that comes out from the star locked into itself. So as the star rotates, the matter that is coming out with the wind will actually rotate with the magnetic field. And therefore, if the Keplerian radius is at a very large radius, and if the star is very slowly rotating, then the centrifugal forces are not going to play a role because you cannot make the material co-rotate with the star. And in that case, you have what is called a dynamical magnetosphere, sphere, which basically means that the material is kind of coming in, it's filling this magnetosphere, sphere, and episodically, the matter can leak out of the magnetic fields, but for the most part, the matter that gets a cre uh, collected or accreted here <coughs> I don't want to use the word uh, accreted, but collected here, will actually go ahead and dribble back onto the surface of the star itself. So that's a situation that happened, but that we expect to see happen if you have a slow rotator. Okay, slow rotation means alpha radius is smaller than Keplerian radius, and you have a dynamical magnetic sphere. Now let's imagine that the star is rotating really fast. When you have faster rotation, what happens? The Keplerian radius starts moving inwards. So now you can have a situation where the alpha radius is out here, and the Keplerian radius is inwards of it. It basically means that out to the alpha radius, the magnetic field still keeps the, mat the wind material locked to itself. So the wind material has to rotate with that speed. However, at all radii larger than the Keplerian radius, the matter can actually be flung outwards. So you have a resonance, as it were, setting up, where the um, where between the Keplerian radius and the alpha radius, the matter can just oscillate and eventually get flung out because of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the centrifugal forces help it to get flung out. So we call this a centrifugal magnetosphere to contrast it with a dynamical magnetosphere. So when the alpha radius is larger than the Keplerian radius, <coughs> you have a possibility of a centrifugal magnetosphere, and that happens because the star is fast rotating and the Keplerian radius has moved inwards. So with that, let's go ahead and do some schematics. <coughs> So imagine if you like an aligned rotator, maybe a situation where the magnetic uh, axis and the rotation axis are aligned with each other. Say you have an alpha radius out here, and you have a certain rotation where the Keplerian radius is outside of it. Then you will have the possibility of a dynamical magnetic sphere. But if you go ahead and spin the star up even faster, you have a situation where the Keplerian radius moves inwards of the alpha radius. And then between this Keplerian radius and the alpha radius, you have a disk-like structure forming. It's actually not an accretion disk. It's basically a disk-like structure of wind trying to move out. <coughs> but now we have the possibility of including three-dimensionality. So imagine if you like that I take this uh, particular situation and I let it tilt in this direction so that the magnetic axis is different from the rotational axis. In that case, you have a situation where the alpha radius could have or, or the alpha radius could have been uh, was smaller than the Keplerian radius and it remains smaller than the Keplerian radius out here. However, notice that the alpha radius has to be measured along the axis of the uh, dipole, whereas the Keplerian radius has to be measured along the axis of the rotation. But imagine taking this situation and tilting it. In that case, you expect something different to happen because the moment arm that the magnetic field has is now dramatically reduced. And because the moment arm 
namely this moment arm as measured in the direction of the rotation is dramatically reduced, you have a situation where something that was a centrifugal magnetosphere can now transition over and become a dynamical magnetosphere. So let's go ahead and see how that works. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of simulations done. And of course, we have the non-magnetized, non-rotating case as a reference. We have a case with rotation as a reference. <coughs> and then I can actually go ahead and have an eta star, namely a magnetized situation. But first with zero rotation rate. And therefore, I have a Keplerian radius that is infinity and an affine radius that is 2.1 times the stellar radius. And I expect that to become a dynamical magnetosphere. I can also have a situation where I spin up the star. I take the same star and spin it up. And in that case, I have an alphane radius that is larger than the Keplerian radius. And so theoretically, I expect this, this to actually work like a centrifugal magnetosphere. But what happens if I go ahead and introduce tilt, namely if I introduce a tilt between the rotation axis of the star and the dipolar axis of the star, <coughs> Then I have a situation where the affine radius can still be larger than the Keplerian radius, but the affine radius with a cosine of 45 degrees can become smaller than the Keplerian radius. Will I still sustain a, a centrifugal magnetosphere or will something else happen? That's the question. We can also have a situation where we have substantially larger magnetic fields. And then we can ask the same questions, except that because we have a larger magnetic field, we have a larger affine radius in these simulations, which allows us to distinguish them from this, these simulations out here. So let's go ahead and see how this story works. Okay. So, one of the things that happens is that in all cases, we can actually verify that there's a quasi steady state that is achieved by the system. So we don't really know. <coughs> We don't really know where the system is located, but if we start it off and let it run for a while, the mass loss rates achieve quasi-steady equilibrium. So you, here we have no rotation and no tilt. And this blue line shows eta is equal to 10. The red line shows eta is equal to 50. And so you see that if you have a strongly magnetized case, namely this red line, then the mass outflow rate becomes smaller than the less strongly magnetized case, which is the blue line. So it shows you that yes, introduction of magnetic fields actually reduces the mass outflow from the star. Will this picture continue if we introduce rotation? And this is the answer out here. So this again, blue line corresponds to eta of uh, 10, and the red line corresponds to eta of 50, namely stronger magnetic field. And again, you see, that going from weaker to stronger magnetic field, you have a reduction in the total mass outflow. Even if you introduce a tilt between the rotation axis and the magnetic dipole axis, you have a situation where increasing the magnetic field, namely going from the blue line to the red line, actually introduces uh, a reduction in the mass outflow. And even if I tilt it to 75 degrees, I see the trace same trend. So I see an interesting result already out here, namely a larger magnetic field corresponds to a lower mass loss rate. Let's go ahead and see in more detail, I wish this projector were a little sharper, uh, but um, let's go ahead and see the situation. So this black line out here, so this shows you the density profile for many of these simulations. This shows you the radial velocity profile. And this black line out here shows you the mass outflow rate. So for our reference simulation with no magnetic field and no um, rotation, <coughs> we have this much mass outflow rate. If we go ahead and just introduce rotation without magnetic fields, we actually see that the outflow rate increases to this amount. So we get our first result that increasing rotation actually makes the mass outflow larger. Now, what if I introduce a magnetic field? That is shown by this 
orange line out here, namely this line out here. So we see that if I just take this simulation and I endow it with a magnetic field, I will actually have a reduced mass outflow rate. And that makes sense because the magnetic field acts like a clutch. It holds the matter in, it prevents the matter from flowing outwards, and therefore you actually have a decrease in the mass outflow rate to this, uh, this orange line. What if I take the same simulation and now spin it up? Then you get to this purple line, which basically shows that introducing spin or introducing rotation even into uh, a magnetized simulation will actually increase the mass outflow rate, but not by as much as you would see in the previous case. Okay? If I go ahead and now introduce a tilt, I see that from this purple line, with increasing tilt, we have reduced mass outflow rate, which actually makes sense because the moment arm is dramatically reduced, okay? So as I tilt, if I'm spinning, let's say I'm spinning here, let's say I'm spinning here, I have a large moment arm. On the other hand, if I'm, my magnetic field is tilted and I'm spinning, then my moment arm is reduced. And therefore, the mass outflow rate in the material that I can fling out is actually reduced in the process. <clears throat> so this actually gives us a good picture, and this actually shows us that, <clears throat> okay, this is a technicality that I'll talk about later, but uh, for those of y'all who know about slow winds and fast winds, you will actually show you that the wind actually splits into a slow and a fast wind with the introduction of a magnetic field. So should, you'll see that very vividly in the next transparency. This is where I can only hope that the movies work. Okay, there's no question about it because the movies did work. So this actually shows us, and maybe I can run the movie again. This actually shows us a magnetized situation with no rotation and no tilt between the direction of the rotation and the direction of the magnetic dipole. Okay? In that case, I have an alpha radius of 2.1 times the stellar radius, and I have a Keplerian radius that goes off to infinity. In that case, we have the alpha radius being smaller than the rotation, Keplerian radius, so we expect this to be a dynamical magnetosphere. sphere. Let's go ahead and see how the simulations run. So, Sadiq, can you, is there some way we can run this simulation again? Is it different on? Yeah, this is actually different. It's actually going back. Yeah, I want us to go back for that. Go back again. Yes, is this one? If, if, yeah, um, apparently, okay. So now let's go ahead and see how the simulation runs. And what you see is that you start seeing the clumping and you actually see clumps of matter forming, as you see out here, and falling back down on the star. And as these clumps of matter fall, fall back down on the star, you can actually begin to see that they start filling up the magnetosphere associated with the star. So that's actually interesting because it actually shows us that this whole picture of a dynamical magnetosphere is valid. The magnetosphere is dynamical, it manages to rein in the outflow of the magnetic field, and it manages to make those clumps of magnetic field actually fall back down on the star, thereby filling up the magnetosphere of the star. <coughs> so you can clearly see that this is not an accretion flow because matter is going in on the star that was actually supposed to go out of, of the star. So yes, it is kind of an accretion flow, but it's an accretion flow from winds. Now let's go ahead and ask what happens if I keep the same magnetization, but I go ahead and spin up the star to a dramatic amount. So that's shown out here. So now this is a much faster spinning star. And now you can see that the phase radius is in principle larger than the Keplerian radius. So in principle, we expect this, this to behave like a centrifugal magnetosphere, except that it doesn't. 
So you can see that again, the matter is clumping up, falling down onto the star. Somehow the movie has slowed down, but you can actually see multiple stages. Okay, so this is as far as we can go. But the interesting thing is that we actually see these instabilities and matter clumping up and falling back down onto the star. <coughs> okay, and that's a good thing. But it shows that the theory is inexact because, in a sense, we should have expected this because the Keplerian radius is smaller than the frame radius. We should have expected this to act like a centrifugal magnetosphere. Unfortunately, it goes and acts like a dynamical magnetosphere. So let's go ahead and continue. And now I'm really going to go ahead and crank up the magnetic field, keeping the same rotation weight. Okay. In that case, we have a situation where the Keplerian radius is significantly smaller than the alpha radius. In that case, you can now see that in fact, the magnetic field lines are significantly distended, but they're managing to hold in the material out to the Keplerian radius. And inside between the, uh, in, they're managing to hold, hold the matter back in inside the alphane radius, but the Keplerian radius is at a much smaller radius out here. And therefore there's a resonance that takes place between these two radii. So let me go ahead and see if I can let this movie run again. And you see that the imprint of the dynamical magnetosphere, namely clumps falling down onto the star, has actually gone away now. So we're truly able to form a centrifugal magnetosphere, except that the theory was a little flawed in terms of where it predicted the things to happen. <laughs> you will have a current sheet out here where the magnetic field lines were supposed to be closed and then eventually they open up. So when the matter is going out, you can see that the magnetic field is getting straight. When the matter is falling in, I don't see the magnetic field is getting uh, uh, Yeah, that's a very good question. But, but the magnetic field goes as 1 over r cubed. So it's very hard to push in on the magnetic field. Yes, it's very, very easy once you go far, far enough outside. And the magnetic field is already beginning to lose to make it kind of go ahead and open. But, but on the other hand, it is the fact that it is falling at all, it has been able to overcome the magnetic field in the first place. And therefore, the pressure gravity must be comparable at least to, to the magnetic field that is already there. Exactly. Exactly. So I would have expected some kind of information from the diagonal field that is deformed, it is there, but I would have, you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't show because, in a sense, I would have to zoom in really into the star in order to show you that each yeah, each operation of the episode kind of causes the superimposing on the yeah. dipole of the yeah. Okay, so we're doing okay. So leave the same if I'm zooming in too much. Okay. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, somebody has written to me that someone people have been asking questions, but that nobody is uh, we are not being able to see. So Saurav is here? Yes, sir, sir. I just told them that uh, you post the question and we will ask after the proper reading. Okay, the questions can be a uh, source of the discussion. So that is good. Okay, so now what if we introduce tilt? We know that in this case, the alphane radius was larger than the Keplerian radius. But if I tilt it, then Ra times cosine of C, zeta, is actually comparable to the Keplerian radius. So we expect that what was originally a, a centrifugal magnetosphere now goes ahead and becomes a dynamical magnetosphere. And let's go ahead and maybe if we can run the simulation again. So we can actually see now that the magnetosphere is being filled in by these clumps. 
However, notice something interesting. Now the magnetosphere is very asymmetric in the sense that the only foot points that are contributing mostly to the outflow, actually the foot points for the magnetic field that are further out, namely this foot point out here and this foot point out here, is not contributing as much to the outflow as this magnetic foot point out here and this magnetic foot point out here. The logical reason for that is that the foot point that is closer to the equator, to the rotational equator, <coughs> is the one that is able to contribute more to the outflow. Now let's go ahead and increase this magnetic field even uh, more so that maybe we have a chance of recovering a centrifugal magnetosphere. Let's go ahead and see if we do that. So I've increased the magnetic field even more. I've kept the same rotation rate. But you will see that now, even so, with the cosine factor thrown in, our Keplerian radius or our alpha radius is much is comparable to the Keplerian radius. And you now see that truly it's the foot points of the magnetic field that are closer to the equator, namely these guys, that are actually driving the outflow. These foot points out here and out here are driving practically nothing. Okay, so we see now that we have uh, a partial confirmation of the theory, but we need that we see also that the theory is not exactly as we expected it to be, because we've introduced the effect of three dimensionality into the simulations. <clears throat> If I have a tilt that is very large, namely the rotation axis is this way and the uh, magnetic dipole axis is this way, then you have a situation where R A times cosine Z, zeta, is actually much smaller than the Keplerian radius. And so we expect this to actually transition over to a dynamical magnetosphere, even though it was expected originally to be a centrifugal magnetosphere. <coughs> And that's exactly what you see here out here. So it's interesting that all our modifications to the, three, uh, to the theory as come from three dimensionality are in fact borne out. So with this, we're done with the movie section of our talk. And now I can just show you some three dimensional Im imagery in case somebody asks, wants to ask questions, but you can actually see that the mesh imprinting is completely gone and we have very clear density waves coming out of the situation. This is showing you all the three different planes. Likewise, you're able to prove, we're able to verify that the velocity magnitude is as we expect it to be. And likewise, we can actually see this in the magnitude of the total magnetic field. Again, I'm showing you the whole image and the zoomed in versions of things. And now we can actually go ahead and be more quantitative. So we can actually go ahead and ask, <coughs> where is the angular momentum coming out from? Now notice that there are two sources of angular momentum. We have angular momentum from the magnetic fields and we have angular momentum from the mass itself. In other words, associated with the outflowing gas, I can have a, magnet, a flux of angular momentum. Notice v, v phi times r sine theta is actually the specific angular momentum multiplied by the density and the radial velocity gives me a measure of the outflowing angular momentum from the gas. But we can also have a source of magnetic field. Notice that this is basically just your pointing vector in a certain sense, v, v r times v phi. And that times r sine theta actually gives me the flux of angular momentum due to the magnetic field. And this is showing you the aligned rotator, okay? And in the aligned rotator, you can see that the majority of angular momentum close to the star is actually carried by the magnetic field lines, specifically the open magnetic field lines. This is showing you the whole simulation and you see that as you go further out from the star, the majority of angular momentum is actually carried by the map. So it gives you an important and interesting picture. And this same picture is borne out even if you have a tilted rotator. 
Namely here, you have a 45 degree tilt between the dipole axis and the rotation axis. And again, you can see that for close into the star, let's show you the zoom in picture, close into the star, the majority of angular momentum is carried by the open magnetic field lines. However, if you look at the full picture, then far away from the star, namely at these radii, the majority of the angular momentum is actually carried by the matter. Similarly, for another situation, you can again verify that the same trend, trend prevails. And now I can actually go ahead and show you that episodically, you have the possibility of these clumps of matter coming out. And this is showing you the clumps of matter projected on the surface of the sphere. So you can see strong clumps of matter blowing outwards. And you can see the same trend in the angular momentum flux, so you can actually see significant amounts of angular momentum flux also going out. And this is a plot of the total angular momentum shown in black compared to the angular momentum carried out by the magnetic fields shown in red and the angular momentum carried out by the gas shown in blue. Interestingly, if I have a smaller magnetic field, you see that at some radius, the gas begins to carry more angular momentum out from the system than the magnetic fields. And this is true at uh, other angles of tilt also. However, look at this situation. This shows a stronger magnetic field situation and it shows that at all radii, the red line is about the blue line, which means that the, out of the total angular momentum carried out by the system, the angular momentum is mostly carried out by the magnetic fields and less by less so by the matter itself. So this shows us an interesting trend. And this actually allows us to tabulate the results and the tabulation of the results gives us an, an interesting insight. Let's look at the two unmagnetized cases, which are these two guys. For the unmagnetized cases, I have a distinct measure of the mass outflow rate. I have a clear measure of the mass of the star itself. So I can calculate the typical mass over which the star will lose a significant amount of its matter. And for the, for the unmagnetized cases, you can see that in 16 million years or 14 million years, the star will lose a significant amount of its mass. So that is interesting because you compare it to uh, the lifetime of such stars, which is also about 10 or 15 million years. So you realize that over the course of their lifetime, if a star is unmagnetized, it's going to lose a significant amount of its mass through winds. But now let's go ahead and consider these magnetized cases. And you will actually realize that the lifetime over which it will lose a significant, or the time span over which it will significantly lose a, a, a significant portion of its mass is actually increased. Namely, uh, a star like this one will only lose a significant mass, a fraction of its mass over 36 million years, but the star doesn't have 36 million years to live. It's probably going to go supernova in 10 million years. So it shows that the magnetic field actually allows the star to retain a significantly larger fraction of its mass. Therefore, it allows the super, a star to actually go supernova with most of its mass held intact and not much of its mass lost. And so that's a good, good realization to have. Now, if you increase the magnetic field even larger, you can actually see that on average, the specific time over which the star would lose a significant fraction of its mass has become even larger, namely, such a star would reach the end of its life with almost all of its mass intact and not much of its mass lost by way of, by way of uh, winds. Now, the interesting thing, the interesting other thing is that we can actually go ahead and tabulate the angular momentum loss. So this is the time scale over which the star would actually lose a significant fraction of its angular momentum. And we see that if the star is very strongly rotating, then of course it will lose its angular momentum very fast. But the interesting re re realization is that magnetized stars, because of their strong magnetic fields, are very prodigious in their ability to lose a significant fraction of their angular momentum. 
And this actually allows us to understand another very important aspect of uh, magnetized massive stars, which is to say that the majority of them are in fact not fast rotators, but rather they are slow rotators. So we actually understand that from this uh, column out here. This column out here just shows you the, theory, the computed angular momentum loss compared to the angular momentum loss as, uh, as predicted by Weber Davis theory. And that ratio is actually pretty good, which just means that the computations are working exactly as one would expect. So, if just one question, is during this process, you did not change the magnetic field of the star at all? No. But in principle, and we have, have also involved. In principle, the magnetic field of the star can also evolve. Yes, so absolutely. And, and, uh, and, and could be very blobs and things could have been taken away by the. You, if the magnetic field is not properly anchored in the center of the star, then you have no blobs. So you will see the field will gradually go down. In this case, the ability to hold the magnetic field also go down. So this may be the upper limit of what is the case. Yes, these are just theoretical limits. Theoretical upper limits it could have been eligible. Yes. yes. That's absolutely good. absolutely good interpretation. Um, so with this, we actually come to the end of this, this talk, which is to say that this effort began with an ability to, uh, or an interest in uh, simulating uh, spherical systems with meshes that are especially suited to those spherical systems. Uh, you know, for and we have actually fulfilled on that promise because we can actually now simulate magnetized stellar winds with large angles of tilt between the rotation rate and the, uh, and the dipole moment. So, so that it shows that full three dimensionality has been achieved and it gives us important insights because it shows us that in all situations, we do have quasi-static quasi outflows, but those outflows are not exactly static. Namely, you have episodic events of mass and angular momentum and ejection. As you increase the magnetic field strength, you suppress the amount of mass outflow. As you spin up the star, you actually increase the amount of mass that outflows. The rule of tilt is that as you increase the tilt, you actually suppress the amount of mass that is outflowing on, on average. And there are some exceptions, but uh, on average, the statement is true. So it's a, it's a good insight. So it shows that even the inclusion of three dimensionality does not change some of the robust conclusions that we presented before. <coughs> and we're able to actually predict the time scale over which a significant amount of the mass is lost and a significant amount of the spin is lost. But we actually get some nice insights about uh, the, the role of magnetic fields in producing supernova progenitors. And um, basically, we're in the process of doing uh, simulations with uh, energy input and radiative losses, etc., which will allow us to predict H alpha output as well as X ray output and radio emission from these uh, sim simulations. And that will give us a full and complete picture of the emissivities of these simulations also. And so we have a full radiation hydrodynamic type treatment of these problems. So, with that, I will thank you all and uh, thank you very much for your attention. So one thing is that this uh, magnetic field, we usually talk about this magnetic field driven outflows, okay. So that uh, whenever there is an open magnetic field, the magnetic fields are outflows are also driven. Uh, so here you are seeing increasing magnetic field suppresses mass mass outflow. That is the field, uh, these are the closed fields. Closed fields, yes. 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 That is Otherwise, you know, the, the indication of activities and leaks, you mm -hmm. know that the open fields will be uh, yes. not yes. open and other things. Yes, absolutely. Is there any question? Yes. So, so, in these solutions, is there any viscosity or only the magnetic field? We, we keep it as invested as possible. Invested. So, in case if we put viscosity, will the viscosity will be dominated by this magnetic pressure or the magnetic pressure will still be, be the dominating part? It's hard to say because for the physics of this particular problem, there is no overwhelming reason to increase the viscosity. Okay. If anything, there is a 
greater reason to kind of diminish or reduce the viscosity to as low as possible because then you have the possibility of the largest amount of turbulence developing, which means that you have more shocks developing, which means that you have more sites from which you can get uh, high energy X rays. So, in this particular simulation, we're not helped in terms of our interpretation of the physics by going ahead and introducing sort of uh, additional viscosity. And one thing is that keeping that, I was assuming that the magnetic field is fixed, not dynamic. So we can play with these three parameters and maybe we have some critical values for the highest life of the star for a particular mass or the lowest life. So have you studied all these surveys that we support? Particular for a critical set of critical binder space, highest type or lowest type for particular mass. Yes, so you asked a very nice question. Uh, are there any people who are playing with AI in this room? Yeah. Oh, you're playing with AI. That's right. So there, there, is, there is an interest in, uh, like, let's say each of these simulations uh, is quite expensive. Okay. Yes, on, yes. On, because it's fully three dimensional and on some of our supercomputers, we can kind of push them through in two or three days simply because we have very powerful supercomputers in, in, you know, in where, where I work. Uh, but, uh, uh, but even so, uh, I oftentimes toy with the idea that if I had um, a full table like this, a full table like this, yeah. can I not have somebody filling in the roles of everything that is between all the points. 10 and 50? Maybe I give you all this data, you feed it into your AI system. Sorry. Can you not tell me what happens when eta is set to be 25? Or the, when the rotation rate is set to be 0 0.2? Okay. Yes. There's no need to uh, kind of you know, no, no. simulate each and every case to its bitter death. Better to kind of simulate some cases and let an yes. AI system kind yes. of you know predict the rest. So that would be interesting. So I think in that case, random college algorithm supervised learning or artificial neural network can help you to eat the whole parameter and you can ultimately put the critical values. Yes, so I mean, for example, the community would like to, uh, the community has dozens of such stars, maybe many, many tens of such stars. So uh, do we need to do, for example, to fully flesh out the physics of this one system, we needed to do something like 10 simulations. Can somebody with AI expertise help us to have intelligent predictions of what happens yes. for, yes. for all the hundreds of st stars that are of interest? Even for 20 months, I think AI may not give the a good prediction because you know AI also lots of limitations and lots of parameters are there for field. And my third question is that you know, so the, after you replaced Professor Chakrabarty's insights by a perfect AI system, you can come to me and replace my insights with a perfect AI system. Mm -hmm. Then, then there'll be no need for theorists or computationalists. <laughs> And the AI system will predict everything. <laughs> it's not been, I mean, all India and particularly yes. many of many science have, has not been put yet. Okay. Yes. So, so you will have something in some spot, but the spot will have some spray. So basically, there are there will be critical region. Let us put it this way. And are all the one person just in your similar something was showing that keeping the magnetic field fixed. Once the rotation is going off, for a certain value, the outflow rate is, but the mass release rate is going down. So, what is the reason behind that? Uh, well, for, for a particular magnetic field, if you spin up the star, you, in general, always lose more mass than if you don't spin up the star. Okay? So that accords with our intuition and that accords with what we expect. Now, if you increase the magnetic field, retaining the same spin, then you will diminish the amount of outflow. And that also makes sense because the magnetic field tries to rope in the outflow. Oh, 
<laughs> is actually clumps of matter that is actually coming out. And if you have the successive such years, you will be seeing successive years yes. of this thing, and they are not necessarily accessibility, so you have to capture the full on Exactly. you want to ask directly. Why doesn't somebody read up this question? No, do you want to ask directly? Okay. There is not some question in the so why you can ask him and you can ask your question, he can hear you. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear now? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we just start with our magnetized case and we just let the situation evolve to this point. So we just let the system find a steady state and the system is capable of finding a steady state within a few days of real simulation time, of, 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 of clock time. Okay, not simulation time but clock time. So in other words, you start with any crazy configuration of magnetic field and outflow and you, you let the star evolve by itself. And the star will naturally, or the simulation will help you to naturally find the conditions under which the star wants to kind of reach steady state. Does that make sense? So this actually, so, so this actually allows us to understand what is happening in these simulations. Now, with that said, I can actually go ahead and then turn it around to the question of neutron stars. For, for a neutron star also, you will actually reach some sort of steady state relatively quickly. So you need to reduce it one. So for a neutron star also, you will reach some sort of steady state very quickly. But ask yourself, what is the rotation period for a neutron star? It's probably measured in uh, in seconds or tens of seconds or maybe a fraction of a second. So in that case, you don't have time enough for effects such as antipolar diffusion, etc., to play a role in reconfiguring the magnetic field of the neutron star. So this is 
These simulations, if they're transported over to neutron stars, would be a very powerful way of identifying uh, the magnetospheric structure of these neutron stars and perhaps even boundary at the light, co light cylinder is active. Okay, but that's as far as the physics from these simulations can go. You cannot, but if you're interested in neutron stars, you're welcome to kind of uh, uh, drop me a line and chat with me because, uh, you know, I, I do have some ideas, but actually it tells you that um, it, tell, it gives you a sense of what this is geared towards doing and also a sense of what this is geared not towards doing. So it's not geared towards kind of giving you the long-term evolution of a neutron star over thousands of years where you have a possibility of uh, crustal rearrangements and star quakes and things like that on the surface of the neutron star. So it's not geared towards that. DJs and all these crystals, it's, you know. Crystallization of the crust and things like that. So yeah. that, that cannot be, that is not within That is not within the scope. He's saying something. Go ahead, Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Now there's a but associated with it, and you probably want to ask that but question. Um, yeah. Uh, Since we're talking about spinning no, neutron no, stars, 
let me put a very positive spin on this, which is to say that the physics that you would employ may well be slightly relativistic versions of these same equations, but you could use these same equations and a modified modified simulation to actually predict the angular momentum loss uh, of a spinning neutron star. So that is all very fair game bunny. And uh, that 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 is something that can be looked into and you should get in touch with me if you want. No, I have, I have one, one comment on that. The point is that if the field is too high, it is not going to be anchored by the magnetic spine in the first place. I agree. So there's a limit to how much. Yeah. So how you can arbitrarily have a star and the field, they are not independent. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, so you can this is not a parameter. But we know that, but we know that magnetars can sustain 10 to 19, 10, 10, 15 to 10 years. 19, 20 even 19, I can do. But the, to, if you require 32, it will not. It will just be out. Uh, yes. Pointly, pointly, it will come out. Even yes. So, so there's, there's, a there's a limit. There's a limit to how strong a magnetic field you can anchor onto the surface of any star. Yes. And for for a for a and neutron a star, I think magnetars show us what that limit is. 10 to 19, around 19, 15 to 19 is a big number. In fact, the monsters, the magnetars, 10 to 19 is a big number. That is yes. the number that we see. Okay, extremely good discussions. Any other question? Actually, we already had very good discussions. I don't know about the future. All the future thing is discussed. Discuss. That the, it is going towards artificial intelligence, it is going towards neutron star, it is going towards addition of a radiation, a radiative transfer, mm -hmm. a loss of energy due to synchronous emission. Yes. Very nice, good science will come out from this. Yes. 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 Sudhir, do you have something to say? Uh, I, I, I've seen this. Uh, but anyway, is there a direct observe, observable, yes. like, can we see? Is, is it resolvable, this jets from any? Star so that we can see this kind of pattern that you are showing or uh, again I would direct you to the point that these simulations are run for a span of few days. Uh, few days. Few days, like four or five days or ten days in physical in physical time. Yeah. Whereas if we if we ask what is the time scale for the spin down, it is measured in millions of years. So, uh, so we're just giving an order of magnitude estimate. We cannot give you direct moment. This moment. matter is piling up. No, this matter which is coming out, uh, they're piling up in the form of some kind of nebula or something. Yes. So, so, so those nebulas. You cannot just run a disappear in space. Ah, okay. Wait, 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 wait. wait. The, you you touched upon a very important point. Oh, for doing. For those of y'all who are really interested in something else, here is something else. You see this picture? Um, yeah. This picture is a picture of Supernova 1987A. It went off in 1987. It's been 30 or so years after, after it went off. The reason you have these clumps out here is that people expect that there's going to be around the star a fast wind and a slow wind. Okay, so the fast wind will be the wind that is coming off from the poles of the star, yeah, yeah. and the slow winds will be the winds that are coming off from the equator. equator of the star. So we expect that there is going to be some dense matter. Uh, we would call it a disk like matter, but it's maybe not a disk, it's just a wind that is kind of finding its way out of the star. Okay, but we expect some sort of ring of dense matter or a disk of dense matter. And when the supernova goes off, <coughs> it successively overruns little fragments of that disk. Of course, you see it as clumps out here, but uh, it successively overruns fragments of the disk. And in doing so, it basically lights up the disk. So, in fact, if you're interested in that sort of problem, then yes, you can take these simulations, you can say, what is the effect of the disk having sculpted out the interstellar medium? And then you can run a supernova simulation inside of that and see if the simulation will light up the, the rings successively as the supernova shock starts over, 
starts running over the disc of the thing. This clumpiness are mostly due to radiator uh, kind of instability rather than uh, inertia lighting up. Yes. So they got clumpy because of radiator kind of. Yes, I'm not dis disputing that, but you can still get a radiator instability if you have dense material being hit by lighter supernova injection. Ejector. So you could you could form radiated instabilities just from that. And you could also form certain forms of cathodic yeah. yeah. So yeah. the radiation coming out of the star itself can interact with the clumps or things. Uh, so is there any uh, uh, observation observation possible so that uh, we can find out the different types of plants or structure formation in different stars from the radiation coming out from the star itself? So I think I think this this is a good example yes, of it. Yeah, already we were lighting up that that yes, matter. Yes. Yeah. So and, yeah. and we know of we know of light halos around the system. So we know that successive rings as they moved outwards okay. emitted and formed light echoes, which we can see around 1987. Okay. Okay, I think we have enough. You think so? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Do so you uh, we, uh, we really think that we need to discuss anything anymore after that, that up and up? We already had a lot of discussions. Yeah. Yes. So I think we can uh, basically thank him once more for coming here and show sure that some book science will come up in future as a result of his visit. At least some of you will think something new. and. Uh, and to go in different directions. Yeah, so, Mani, Mani, if he's still around, you can get in touch with me if he's interested in neutron star yeah, problems. Yeah, he is. Mani is there. Mani is there. Still, Mani. Mani, are you there? Check, I think. See that. See that. He left. Go okay. there. Yeah. Some because it is already two hours, three hours, two and a half hours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think he is now. It was originally meant to be a one and a half hour visit. Yes. Time dilation. Realistic people, kind of set all those others. So, okay, so I think we should call it a day. We can drink some tea, we can go upstairs and have, we have some tea arrangement. We can, I hope, I don't know what is happening in the upstairs. But by the way, should I take out the. Yes, you should take the. Anyway, nothing.